I uh, have been a beekeeper for 32 years now. Uh, I started in 1983. I had moved into an old farmhouse at Eaton Rapids and had bees in the wall, and so I, I just started reading about them, was interested in them. Uh, I got a couple good books. There was not many mentors around at that time, so we kind of self-taught. Um, ABZ, XYZ, a bee culture was really my mentor. And it's kind of broken down so you can read little, a couple pages at a time, you know, and it's, 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 it was a really cool book to learn from and it helped a lot. Uh, but now um, I've been doing this for, like I say, 32 years. I've been raising queens for over 10 years now on my own. I, I hate buying packages and and then I started, we started our club a few years back and uh, it's been fun. I, I don't know how they picked me as their, their leader, but they did. And so, um, but I enjoy working with people and, and trying to mentor, even though I, I get so busy, I, I can't hardly seem to get everything taken care of. But anyway, I wanted to talk about some things that new beekeepers probably don't know about. I've never done this slide presentation before, so I don't know how long it's gonna run. Probably I could make it run for an hour and a half or, or maybe 20 minutes, I don't know, we'll see. But first of all, I wanted to talk about signs at the entrance, and I saw Zach was talking about that this, the, in the last session, which is, which is great. Um, I uh, had a picture I was going to throw up here, and I just ran out of time. But you know, basically, you're looking and uh, at the activity of the bee flight coming into the entrance on a nice day. And really, if you have more than one hives, you can use that to compare to. But you should see pollen coming in, pollen foragers. There should be some guard bees, although some hives tend to have a lot more guard bees than others. And uh, these hives that I brought uh, don't have many guard bees and they're also not very aggressive either, which is one reason I picked them. I didn't, um, and my hives are on the other end, but, and they weren't as strong as, they, quite as strong as I wanted them to be, but they're still gentle bees. Um, that's what you're looking for. Um, as you walk up to the hive, <coughs> look at the front, uh, see how many dead bees are in front of the hive. You shouldn't have a lot of them. A uh, few are normal, but the undertaker bees oftentimes will haul them out and, and haul them away unless there's a huge number of bees and then they just throw them out the front and you start seeing bees piling up, then you know you had a problem. Maybe a pesticide kill or, or something, a, a mass die off. Um, and then you're also looking for crawlers, deformed wing bee, uh, virus bees, uh, which I have a picture of farther into the uh, presentation. And of course I mentioned the dead and dying bees. Uh, the other thing, and then when you get into the hive, um, uh, how many of you are first year beekeepers anyway? And, and Okay, so I'm just dealing with a couple of newbies and mostly everybody's had bees for a while, so I'm not gonna get into that much detail about some things. When you look at your frames, you're gonna see eggs, you're gonna see larva and pupa. Uh, the eggs are, um, if you see eggs, which are hard to see, but if you get the light just right, you can see them. Um, they're gonna be in there for three days, and that really tells you whether there was a queen there in the last three days, even if you can't find her. And then uh, the ratio of uh, pupa to larva is gonna be two to one, because uh, pupa, they're in the pupa stage for 12 days, uh, the worker bees anyway, and, and the larval stage for only six. So obviously if the queen is laying uh, the same amount of eggs each day, you have a two to one ratio. So you should see double the amount of sealed brood that you see um, open, open brood. Uh, you wanna look uh, at the honey frame, see if they're bringing in honey, make sure they've got enough honey in the hive that they don't get starved. Surprisingly, this, uh, I started some nukes um, a few weeks back and uh, Last week it rained so much that they weren't foraging very well and I'd fed them, I gave them a frame of honey when I started them, yeah, but there was some of them getting a little light and uh, you don't want them to run out. When they get down to a, um, data said that if you got down below three frames in your hive, the queens would shut down. And that's pretty much two because they start to conserve that food and they'll cannibalize their young. <coughs> the same with pollen. Pollen's important, obviously it's their uh, protein that they use in the hive. 
And it's nice to have that diverse supply. Um, and uh, we were, we heard, or I heard in one of the other sessions, you know, the different subfamilies in the hive, you know, collect different kinds of pollen, and that gives that diversity. and also improves the health of the hive because of the, the pollen that they're collecting. This, uh, you see the multiple eggs in there? That's uh, a laying, uh, indication of a laying worker. And if you see that, and oftentimes those eggs are on the sides of the cells, um, it's a problem. This actually was a, a queen that was, had gone nuts but, and was in a strict, restricted area, but um, it was unusual. And so if you see multiple eggs, then you may have a problem. You, gotta, you probably do have a problem because I've only seen this like this one time. Um, you need to correct that. Uh, there's, I've heard of people shaking, laying workers out and, you know, away from the hive, but the laying workers can fly back. They'll come back to the hive if you set it up, and, and if that's gone, then they'll go to one next to it. I've lost queens in the adjoining hives by doing that. Sometimes you can, I've heard that you can, uh, place a queen where the bottom board is and take the laying worker hive and put it above in a screen and the workers will work their way around and accept the new queen. Um, I, I like to use a two-day-old larva and just start a queen cell. And they'll accept a queen cell that way and build it up. Um, and uh, when the queen goes out and mates, then that kind of straightens the hive around. That works pretty good. Um, um, Back to this, uh, the amount of brood food uh, around in the larva. When you see, uh, I don't know if I get what I got. The larva should have lots of royal jelly. Now these are older larvae, but they sh uh, even at a young age, a day or two old, they should be just flooded with royal jelly. And if they're deficient in bringing in pollen, even if there was some in the sides of the hive. And stored and framed, you'll see them cut back, and they'll start to cannibalize that if it gets too too uh, too short. I think it is a problem sometimes later on in the summer when we um, start to get into a dearth period. I, I'm not sure that's going to happen in Michigan this year. We've had so much rain; it may be green until the middle of August, and then we're going to start seeing uh, uh, goldenrod blooming, but. Uh, dry years, sometimes I think it's important that you give them a pollen supplement. And one way you can tell is by looking at the uh, drone brood. Uh, queens will stop laying in drone brood and they'll quit producing drones when there's a pollen shortage. And if you see um, no eggs in the drone brood and they start to fill them with honey, then probably they're getting deficient in pollen in the summertime. And that's when it's not a bad idea to, to feed some protein supplement, at least start uh, thinking about it. Because uh, after they cut back on the drones, then it starts affecting the worker brood too, which is uh, important to have healthy brood that time of year so that they can raise the healthy bees for the, that go, take us through the winter. Um, so <coughs> Steve Tabor wrote a book uh, years ago called Breeding the Super Bee, and he said, it, it quoted in the book, you know, they, they aren't laying eggs. That means they haven't had good, uh, adequate pollen coming in for three or four days. They quit. If you don't see any brood in the drone frames, then it's probably been a week or longer. And if you don't see any drones at all, it's been a couple weeks or two or three weeks. Cause, uh, and if you use that, it'll help you read what's going on in that hive as far as protein and what you might have to do with it. Well, we've heard a lot about varroa mites. Um, this is the K-wing, it's a virus uh, that is vectored through the mite. Here's deformed wing virus. And you'll actually see this, bees crawling around on frames. Uh, there's a varroa mite. You don't often see varroa mites in, on the bees until, in any large number until they get way up above 10%, but you do see them. And you'll see these K, uh, deformed wing bees and the K-wing walking around, they call them crawlers, walking around in front of the hive. And if you start seeing that, then you probably got a viral load that's getting pretty high. 
and you probably got a mite problem. And uh, it's a good indication when you're walk, just when you walk up to the hive that you have a problem or when you're looking at the frame. So when I'm scanning my frames, looking to see what it looks like, I'm also looking at some of the bees to see if they have some of these symptoms. There are at least 18 viruses that they've isolated that the bees can get, um, and a lot of them really affect the health of the bee. Some of them, <coughs> it's hard to know whether they have them or not, uh, like uh, a black cell virus, that uh, queen cell virus is one that you wouldn't really know they have as a virus until you start to raise queen cells, and it'll kill the queen cells in the, in the pupil stage, but, or, or larval stage, yeah, pupil stage. But uh, it's there and it causes health problems in the hive, just the same. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about difficult colonies. You get them once in a while, and um, I hate mean bees. I'm sure most of you do too, uh, if, you, if you do like mean bees. Uh, and uh, oh, that's great. Um, <clears throat> they claim that there's. Mean bees uh, will produce more honey, and there's, but there's really no correlation. Uh, some really gentle hives make a lot of honey too. They may be better robbers. They may rob other hives and steal honey from other bees, you know, other hives, but they aren't more aggressive uh, collectors of honey always. Um, <coughs> but if you... Um, have a mean hive, the first thing, and especially if they've been normal and then all of a sudden they seem to get ornery, you may look at the front entrance and see if the grass is knocked down or matted down because oftentimes it's a, a skunk or a, even raccoons and possums like to eat bees. And uh, uh, raccoons like the, the, um, the brood too and they'll pop the tops off and pull the frames out just like a bear and eat them. Uh, but skunks is probably the most common thing, and they, they have their whole families come, and they have a smorgasbord, and they like to come back day, night after night, and, and it can cause a problem. A couple things you can do about that is to raise your hive up a little bit so that the, the um, skunk has to get up on its hind legs a little bit, to, and then the bees can attack its stomach when it starts to harass the hive, and that'll chase them away. Uh, some people have made these little spike boards that they put in front of hives. You can put a little screen so that they can't scratch the front entrance, because that's what they do. They'll scratch the front entrance, and um, the bees will come out to investigate, and then they smash them, and then they'll eat them. And they just, again, they're sweet, so they, they, and they love bees. Um, another thing for mean hives is if you've, if, uh, a lot of times they've lost their queen, possibly, and queenless hives will be ornery or uh, if you need to go in and replace the queen, what I would recommend is a couple things. Uh, number one, if you want to just look for the queen, take um, half the hive body and move it over away from the hive, maybe 30, 40, 50 feet. And all the field bees or the older bees will come back to the hive, and then you can go through and look at the frames one at a time and see if you could spot her. And I'll talk a few minutes about, uh, in a few minutes about how you find queens. Um, <clears throat> Usually the bottom box has got the older bees in it, and that's the one that's going to be more ornery. So you can pull that off and swap boxes, but you may want to let it set or maybe put a queen scooter in there and let it set for an hour or so so that the old bees end up in the bottom, but then move that out of the way, um, someplace away. And they're still going to get right in your face uh, sometimes. Um, make sure you suit up good and... Yeah, there's times when you want to wear your uh, gloves if you don't, and, and I'm sure yeah, a lot of you do. Um, like I said, sep and if you haven't found the queen, put a queen excluder in there and, and wait three or four days, and then when you pull that, go through those boxes, you can find look for eggs, and at least it'll narrow it down to which box it is. And if you use the mediums, you may need two two queen scooters. But it's 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 um, it's not always easy to find queens with all those bees. But it helps. Uh, another thing that you can really do if you want to run it is to get a nuke established above that hive and let it set for a few days. Let the the, the smells acclimate, 
And oftentimes you can use this newspaper method and the old queen will end up coming up missing and you can replace her that way. Um, and that's probably the easiest, but I never feel sure that it's, they're gonna replace the right queen. So I, 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 I'd rather find that old queen, but I'm, I, I'm a lot better at it probably than a lot of people at this stage. Um, so, look at the brood. So when you're looking for the queen, you're pulling out the frames. You're gonna look in the brood nest for the queen because that's where she's gonna be. Or wherever there's brood, she's gonna be in that area. She may be on the peripheral, but she's usually in that area. Some Italian queens are easy to find. They're nice and light and they're beautiful queens. Unfortunately, I, I don't think they survive as well in Michigan. I think the darker bee, bees, the Carnolians and the uh, Caucasians seem to be better survivors in Michigan. Um, you look for the eggs, um, that helps. <coughs> and when I hold a frame up, mediums is easier, I, I hold it up and I look a little bit on the top and then I scan right on across, look at, look at every bee. And then I go down a little bit and I scan right on across and I look, I try to look at every bee. And a lot of times you'll see her screen in there. And then, then I just, I'm holding it by the top bar. I flip it over and I scan it back and forth just like I did. And of course I have deeps and mediums is easier because you're not looking at this big an area. And some queens run and as you flip it over, she'll run over to the other side. So keep, keep your eye on that sometimes. Uh, Look, tilt the frame, sometimes you can see her profile. And after a while you learn to find parts of the queen. You see the, the, the darker thorax or the longer abdomen. I've had queens just go down in a cell and hide and the only thing you can see is their, their tails sticking out. And they'd stay there, you know. Uh, sometimes they'll hide under bees. If you got natural comb, they'll go in between the frames and hide down in there and go back and forth. And uh, But it, what I would, really advise you to do is when you, after you feel comfortable a little bit with the bees, make sure you learn how to mark queens and it's not that hard. Um, this is what I like to use. Now I'll, I, I don't mind picking up a queen and holding her and putting a dab of paint on her and uh, you can use, get the paint, paint pens, testes paint or, they probably tra practiced out here. Did any of you practice with the marking the drones the other day? Okay, you can, um, you can hold them, but um, I smashed this finger years ago, uh, splitting wood, and it's kind of numb on the tip, and so I don't feel real confident holding a queen because uh, so, I don't have that good feeling. So I use a cup, and you can buy them from uh, Brush Mountain. I've seen they have the ones where you can just squeeze them down gently. Now, you can over-squeeze a queen, and they can faint, but the, the idea is to just to finesse it up just enough to hold her still long enough to get a dab of pain on her. Right on her thorax, right there, mm -hmm. behind her head. Well, some people grab her by her wings, but definitely don't pick her up the by the abdomen. Uh, some yeah. people will grab the wings and get a hold of her, and then they'll hold her this way. And then, uh, if you're going to mark her, of course, you're going to grab her feet and get a hold of her feet and her thorax from the underneath. And she'll bend her tail around and look like she's going to sting you, but queen, I've never been stung by a queen. And then you can dab that pain on and then just set her back on the... Oh, right. We don't want to pull them off, but I don't think, no, but that, you can hang on to her pretty good. It's, okay. it's surprising. Uh, and if you use one of these, you just kind of, she'll be running around trying to get out, and you just push it up just enough and maybe tilt, there's a little stick, you could tilt it a little bit so that you're just holding her still enough to get the, the thorax. And I, I, I now have a, a paint bottle with the testes paint, the little one ounce bottles. And of course, this year's blue, it's a, which means that she was a 2015 queen. Uh, last year was green. Um, this one was probably back in 2009. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'll take a paper clip and just take a little piece of dab on the end of the paper clip and just touch the thorax, and that's usually enough to do it. But get bright, brilliant colors. Don't buy any dark reds or or dark blues, because they are really hard to see, especially on an overcast day. Get the real bright, 
uh, fluorescent colors. The, I got a real light fluorescent blue this year, and last year was a real fluorescent. I like this green, maybe even a little uh, lighter. Um, reds, I, I, I kind of use more of an orange, uh, fluorescent orange, because it seems to, I could see it better. Um, and of course, yellow and white are easy to see. <coughs> but spend a lot of time practicing on drones until you feel comfortable, because you don't want to kill your queen either or hurt her. If you run it all over her body and it runs down, then she's got these spirochetes in the side that she breathes out of, and she won't be able to breathe. The, the bees will want to replace her, so that's how bees breathe. Um, <clears throat> but I would highly recommend, uh, and I've got uh, new beekeepers in my club that have learned how to do it. It's not that hard. It's just more intimidating than it is hard. Okay, so and if you happen to buy a queen, you, I, I highly recommend local queens. Uh, you want something that's going to survive the winters. They do much better than the queens that come from the south. I think all of you probably know that. There's a lot of talk about it now. And there's a lot of introduction methods. Um, a lot of people will get queens in these three-hole vetting cages, and you just take the cork out, and, and sometimes you take a nail, and you can put a little hole in it if it's hard, and uh, they'll work their way out. <coughs> they'll eat the candy and let her out in a couple days. This is the California cage. A lot of times it, it doesn't have candy, so you have to add candy to it. Um, this is what I use, a Benton BZ uh, cage, Jay-Z BZ cage. And this is, has candy in it normally. This is a plastic pushing cage. I don't like plastic pushing cages. I've got a number of them, but they don't work very well. And uh, you can make one out of hardware cloth, really, that works just as good. And I make quite large ones. The pushing cage is one that you're, you're going to find, find a, a frame of brood that's just starting to emerge. And you'll see them chewing through and uncapping the cells. And, um, you could take these push-in cages and place them over that area. It's better if you have a little honey and some pollen in there, but it's not totally necessary because they'll feed through the cage. And then I would I shake the bees off. I take it in my, my shop. You could take it in the house or take it someplace where if the queen gets away, she's not going to get away. And I always go to a window because they always go right up the window if they do get away from you. And then I'll I'll... Take, place her under that cage and, and, and push it down. Am I getting out of your field of view? I, 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 I oftentimes I wander all over. That's why I like this pointer. Um, and uh, if you wait for uh, four or five days or even a week, uh, Russians is even longer, eight or nine days sometimes. The Russians don't accept other queens very well and they don't, uh, others don't ex uh, accept Russians. Races tend to be dip more difficult, but uh, because they smell different, the, the Cardolians, if you're putting them in an Italian hive and, and, and that kind of thing, or if you get an AI queen, which is, smells, doesn't really smell like a queen so much, and they, they don't like them. But uh, <coughs> once they start laying and uh, the, the bees start paying, uh, taking care of them and grooming them, and then they spread that pheromone around, then you could pull that cage off. And that's about the most efficient way to, to introduce queens that I've found. Um, one thing I wanted to mention when I was talking, I realized that I, I have a little wire that I, and I suspend those JZBZ cages down between the frames and I hook it, put a little nail on it to kind of hold it down. And I do that during colder weather when you got a, a, a queen so that they won't pull away from her and, when they go into a cluster on a cold night and uh, let her freeze. Uh, any questions about anything, anything uh, please speak up. Uh, I, if, I'd love to answer your questions. Here's one of those push-in cages like I was talking about. This is a rather small one, but, uh, and they do work. Um, there's a breeder queen in there somewhere, but I don't see her right, right up hand. Anyway, um, this spot right here is where you'd want to set that. See how these bees are starting to merge? So you've got these young nurse bees coming out, and they, they'll start feeding her and taking care of her right away, and they'll clean cells for her, and she'll start laying in there, and that really makes a big difference in the acceptance. Um, let's talk a little bit about feeding. 
In the summertime, uh, you want to feed to stimulate, uh, simu you're going to simulate a, a honey flow, and if you don't have a honey flow, um, it's easier to uh, get queens introduced. Um, you may have to feed them if there's a long dearth. Um, you can uh, feed the uh, one-to-one -one syrup, which is uh, five pounds of sugar, six quarts of water. And if you want fall feeding, where you're, you're going to cut the water in half, so it's two-to-one syrup, and it'd be five pounds of sugar to three quarts of water. Now, I had to figure this out because I used 25-pound bags when I mixed mine, but it's the same. Essentially, you want a thinner syrup so that you're simulating the nectar flow in the summer and the fall. They don't have time to dry the honey out or the sh sugar if you're feeding. Um, so you want it thicker so they don't have to get rid of as much moisture. If they don't get it all dried out before it gets too cold, uh, they'd be, uh, uh, they may have too much moisture in the hive during the winter time. Um, <coughs> and the idea when you're fall feeding is you can't go out there and give them a, a gallon of syrup and then feed them in another week another gallon because what they do is they take it down and there's just not enough to flood the brood nest enough to back. And so the queen starts laying again. It stimulates her to lay. And so then they start consuming that syrup and they'll uh, use it all up. And the next week when you go back out there, um, you're just feeding them and stimulating brood. And you have to, if you need, I, I weigh my colonies say, uh, and say, for instance, um, I like them all to be between 30, 135 and 100. Or 130 and 135 pounds. So, and if you take a gallon of heavy syrup, it's going to weigh around 10 pounds uh, a gallon when you feed it to them. If my hive weighs 125, then I could get away with a gallon because they're going to put that down there. And you know, there's enough honey in that upper brood nest area that they don't have a lot of room at that point. But if it's down around 100, 100 pounds or 110 pounds, because the queen didn't shut down when, uh, until the honey flow was long over, so they never put any where they needed it, then you may need to feed more. Now you can feed honey to them. You can give them, swap out frames, but uh, a lot of people don't have that around. And I do both. I, I may take some frames of, there are partial frames and put full frames in, but there's still some that needs to be backfilled, or if it's partial and I don't have any more, then I'll, I'll feed them in, and then I'll give them maybe a, a gallon or two or three. You want them to take that down as fast as possible so the queen can't start laying in those areas where the, you want it, because the cluster it naturally comes up, and as that brood hatches, you want them to fill it with, with food, something to keep them alive. Before you start feeding, keep feeding. Yeah, until you've got enough on there and get their weight up. You may want to you may want to try weighing them and weigh them again when you're done to make sure they're heavy enough. And basically keep feeding until I stop taking it? Mm, it generally it works out that way. They just about, when they run out of room, they quit taking it down. But uh, they'll move some down into the lower brood boxes, which is okay. Um, you want them generally, though, in this area to be around 135 pounds for two double boxes. If you're in the UP or something, you may want a lot more than that. It depends on. But um, I learned that from Mike Palmer, who's in uh, Vermont or New Hampshire. I don't remember out east anyway. And he's way up north, Champaign Valley. And uh, he uses, uh, I think, two brood boxes and a, and a shallow. And he goes, he, his weight is 150 goal. And he'll figure how much he needs. He'll write it right on the top, which is what I started doing. Write what it is, and then when you come back, you figure out how much you got to put on there, and you do it all at one time, try to get it all done and move on. So how I do that, uh, friction pail feeders work pretty well, you know, something like that. But if you're using a little quart jar, um, it's just not going to be enough feed. Um, these work uh, pretty well, the top feeders. Um, they don't take it quite as quick as I'd like. Uh, if it gets cold, they, it, they tend to slow down. Uh, these work until the cluster starts to, to pull in uh, fairly well, although you can only get a gallon or maybe two gallons of feed on at a time, and then these are out for fall feeding. 
Don't even try it. Um, what I like to do is I use these coil feeders that Cutler's Bee Supply is using down in the vendor's area, and I, 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 I could put a gallon of feed on. This was a picture of a hive that I put on, went around and finished putting feeders on, so it was maybe 15, 20 minutes later, I come back and pulled the hive box back off because you gotta put a box over that, obviously, and the, and the cover over that to see it. And those bees had already swarmed that thing, and uh, within 24 hours, that gallon is gone. You could actually put three gallons in there, and within two days, all, all of it's gone, uh, 30 pounds of, of syrup. And that's really the way, I'm, what I'm talking about. So where does that, where does that go? That goes down in the brood nest area. It goes in the top. It, it, they would put it, in this area here, because generally this area has got a lot of brood in it, but after the last honey flow, which is the goldenrod flow for me, they, they quit, she, she should shut down unless you got an Italian queen. And as the brood hatches out of that, they'll take that syrup down and, and put it wherever they can put it, because there's so much of it, and it just pushes the queen right down into the bottom box where you want her to start the winter. Oh yeah, it goes in the cells. Uh, at first, it's pretty thin, so they'll put it anywhere. They, and as they dry it out, they kind of consolidate it into the cells, and they and naturally put it above the brood. But as um, they store it, it, it it keeps pushing the queen down farther and farther. So that and you want that feed above that cluster, so that when they rise during the winter, they have something to eat. I've had bees that had a lot of honey down here and a lot of it over here on the sides, but when they got up to the top, there wasn't anything for them. And then when it got cold, they just couldn't get to the food and they just die right there. So you want to make sure that they got, whether you use honey, uh, frames of honey, or, um, I always do a little bit of both and then I finish it up with, with syrup just to make sure they got enough. That's how I do it. You had a question too. Yeah. Could you do something like this um, for fall feeding, something this large? Yeah. For fall feeding, preparing for the winter. You want them to store it and yeah. down. That's and in the summer, um, right now, I think it's kind of slowing down a little bit. I wouldn't use it this time of year. It's for one thing, they take it way too fast and they, it, it, it do the same thing. It, it, it uh, actually flood your brood nest area um, and it may stimulate swarming at this point. That want to stimulate laying. Yeah, then you want to go back to the, the this, this, maybe this type of thing or, or a small friction feeder maybe, but um, you can use these. You just don't want them to take it as fast. Uh, something's a little, a little slower. You could use these if you go out and maybe give them a half a gallon every other day or something like that, or, or a, little, a little less than that even. It depends on the size of your colony, obviously, and how quick you're. I have a scale hive. That's something that I wanted to put in here that I didn't, the BI, uh, BIP or um, BIP or better Be Informed. Uh, website has a portal for hive scales now and they're starting to get more electronic scales and you can go on there and click on a bubble hopefully someday. I, there's four in Michigan right now. I know of another one that's going to come online and you could click on those those little balloons, how those they make the, the maps with the, the little balloons on them. You click on them and then you can get the information for when the honey flow is going. And, um, but anyway, I've got one of those scales, and so you can see how the bees consume it and, and uh, how fast the weight goes down, how fast it goes up, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how they winter and how the weights work in the, in the winter. Um, I'm really anxious to see how that, that my scale hive works that way. Yes? Okay, I've got two questions. Number one is that one on the lower left-hand side. Okay, are you, a lot of the bees drowned in it. Yeah, because you know what happens? They, these aren't sealed very well, and the bees can get under that screen, but they can't figure out how to get out. And it, um, they get in there and they can't get out and they drown. And I've seen that before. I have some of these 
Um, I went around with a piece of silicone and sealed out the screen all the way around. Or the other way is if they can find their way in through the top and they're robber bees trying to get in there from the top, maybe through the inner cover hole or something, they get down in there and they drown. A lot of bees will drown in that. This one at least has floats in it. The idea of this one is they, they're supposed to stay in the screened area. They're supposed to come through this hole and go down and drink, take the syrup and go back up. And if they stay in there and do it the way they're supposed to, it works fine. But if you're having bees drown, they're getting in where they're not supposed to. You may want to seal around all the way around the screen so they can't get in. And, and then uh, make sure that there's something really flat like the outer cover laying on top of that with a brick on it so they can't get through that way. And, and it could be either place where they're getting in. Uh, my dad had the same problem. <coughs> he first tried them too, and I, I've, see, I've seen it too. I, that's, what I, that's what I did to fix it. I don't use these. I, I, they set in my shed, and I uh, use them in an emergency if I run out of the other feeders. But they, they work, but I could like put a couple of gallons. So I can put a lot more syrup on them, but the bees don't take it as quickly. They, they take it probably at an adequate rate for fall, but um, I like the other ones. I can get in and get them done and get them and move on. But, but it would work just fine for you. But that's what you're going to have to do with, to keep them from drowning. So on the, on the one on the top left there, that's um, uh, on top of your top. The yeah, and, and of course, this feeder and, and this feeder, you'd have to have another box over the top with another cover on it. This one, uh, if you're not familiar with it, has a screen in the center of the, the cover, and the bees sir, uh, sip the syrup through the screen. They have a tendency to leak a little bit in cold weather, um, and that's one uh, disadvantage using them. You could get one gallon size, which is this one may be a, a two gallon size, um, and you could probably get a bigger, but uh, if they get too tall, you can't get a cover or can't protect them. You don't wanna, in the fall when there's no honey flow going, you gotta be careful of, of robbing because bees um, don't have anything to do, and if they find a, a syrup source, especially if you're using Honey Bee Healthy, which is probably good for the bees, but it also drives them crazy, and they really, uh, Try real hard to rob people each each other's hives out. What if uh, what if they you put that up there and they just don't eat it? Yeah, there's probably something wrong with them. I I see hives like that once in a while. <coughs> if you try to feed them and they aren't taking syrup in the fall and you know the bees are, then they probably have no sema or something that's making them sick. And sometimes um, if you uh, put honeybee healthy or something that they really love in their feed. It's a feed stimulant. You can, uh, uh, Dennis was just talking about that downstairs a little while ago. It may flush out their system and uh, because bees that have been fed honeybee healthy tend to have less nosema than bees that, that haven't gotten it. So that's, that's the only thing you can do. Uh, generally, I found that if bees don't take the syrup in the fall, they, they aren't going to make it through the winter either. They just die. There's something wrong physiologically with them, which is, you've probably seen that maybe or maybe not. I know I see it once in a while. Okay, enough about that. No, any more questions? Um, Robbing is another one that's a big concern to me. And if you only got a couple hives in one area, it's, Maybe not a big problem, but if you get multiple hives, some weaker or smaller, some from stronger, you lose honey flow. Um, the bees, maybe you left a frame out, like uh, they, they took a frame out of one of the, my hives out here and put it in the back of my truck. And now the bees are trying to, they're or in my trucks, robbing those frames out. Now, when they get through that, then they're gonna go around and look at one of these nuke boxes and start robbing that out, because that's what bees do. Um, when I am at home, I walk out to my honey house, they'll be waiting at the door for you to open the door so they can get in there once they start robbing. Uh, they drive me nuts. Uh, and so you gotta be careful, especially in a dearth. Uh, there are things you can do to, to, to 
circumvent that some. Uh, one of them is avoid leaving honey unprotected, which is what's going on right now outside. Um, <coughs> you want to avoid lengthy hive inspections. Now the robbing that's going on out there isn't serious. The serious robbing is when there's just bees all over. And, and, but it's, it, it could escalate if it, if, if it rained or something. And then you want to redirect the entrance. And the way you do that is a robbing screen. And these are a couple examples. Uh, the bees are, the robbers are trying to get into this, this entrance down here. On this one, it's down here. And you redirect the hive entrance to up here so the bees that are coming and going are coming out the top. And on this one, they're going in, in this way. And they, they never do quite figure out when the robbers that where the, the entrance is. They always want to go right direct. They want to uh, go right in there. So, Doesn't that restrict your bees coming in? Oh, sure it does. They have to, oops, excuse me. Uh, they have to go right straight up and, and out. And uh, they figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, for a day or two, they'll bunch up down here and they walk around until they find the way in. Is it at night? Or does it matter? You know, if it's robbing, you put them on when you need them. Uh, I, uh, well, I, on my nuke boxes, after my queens are made it, I'll put robber screens on them, you know, from about now or a little later on. You know, it depends on the honey flow, what's going on. Because uh, uh, I've got stronger hives at home that'll overpower them. They'll rob them right out, and then they don't have any food. They'll starve to death if you're not right on top of it. Sometimes you have to move them, but um, these... Well... They fight and they're sneaking around. And if you look at the capping, you'll see where they've just uh, gone after. You see bees in there just trying to take the honey out of the frames. And there's a lot of wax underneath the hive. And they fly around and fight each other. And you'll see them hovering in front of the hive trying to get into that spot. It looks a little bit like uh, young bees on their orientation flight in a way, but they're, they, they really pick on one hive, it seems like, at a time. And when they get finished with that one, they'll move on to the next one. It's sometimes a little hard to recognize, and sometimes there's just a few bees that are robbing all the time, like what we have out here. But uh, it's generally older bees that are dark. Uh, they oftentimes don't have very little hair because they're old. They've they're, all their hair's falling out, just you know, and they, and they're trying to get an easy meal out of it, you know, and take it back. It's easier than foraging, yeah, but it's it's no fun. Yeah, uh, Italians are notorious for for robbing. They they rob worse than the others, but they all will rob some if they need to. Yeah. Yeah, the, the nukes, I do. I don't do it with my larger hives. They usually um, protect, you know, fend off robbers if they're real strong. But be aware of it. Uh, it's something you have to be... Uh, if you got a neighbor that's got an, a large apiary and you just got a couple of hives, you still got to worry about it because they'll come over in, in August or maybe later in September and try to, try to steal your honey. And you'll go out there, and there won't, your hive will be really light. So what happened to this one? Okay, stings. A little bit about stings. Um, I, I, I think everybody's allergic to stings, but you build up immunities, um, and I don't really react to it anymore. But uh, I did. I was really intimidated by stings when I got started. I'm sure everybody is. If they do sting you, it'll kill the bee. Um, and you want to take that stinger and scrape it off, use a, your fingernail or a hive tool. Or, they claim if you squeeze it, it will just force the more poison down into your skin. Um, uh, there's a syndrome, uh, or what they say, uh, family beekeeper syndrome, where if you're a beekeeper and you're exposed to venom by stings on your suit or on your hands or your clothes, you go home and expose it to your your kids and your spouse and your dogs. Uh, some of them, a certain amount of them, will develop antibodies and react more severely to stings when they get stung. My wife is one of those. I know one in almost every family. 
if you avoid stings, uh, after you've been stung a few times or if you're handling your bee suit, um, that, those antibodies can cause you to have a more severe reaction. So beware that a lot of beekeepers after a while just, just decide that they're going to try and um, not avoid stings or take a sting every couple of weeks to keep you know, more immune to stings. And it sounds pretty intimidating, but uh, otherwise you just want to really protect yourself and your family. Commercial beekeepers <coughs> or larger beekeepers will have a laundry out away, you know, out in their bee house or something and wash their clothes and not wear them in the house and close those up. Now, you're, if you only have a couple colonies, you may be okay, but just beware of that. It could happen. Uh, my wife at this point will have a, a, like a stage two reaction where she gets these hives and all the way from head to toe and she gets really itchy and she doesn't always react this way. She had a beekeeper or I mean a doctor tell her to take a Benadryl and a Zyrtec and so she takes one now when she gets stung like in the honey house when she's extracting with me and, and it seems to have warded that off but it can get serious. Um, let's see how to read what I got here. Sting immunity, limiting sting. So, so limiting stings may cause you to be uh, react more severely yourself too. So be aware of that. Another thing uh, that affects uh, your reaction is as uh, 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 ACE inhibitors and NAS aids uh, like ibuprofen. I a few years ago was having some arthritis pain. I started taking arthritis and then I started noticing my fingers were starting to swell up more than they ever did for a long time. And I did some research and went to my doctor and talked about it and uh, I started taking aspirin or you gotta find something that works for you. But actually bee stings are pretty good for you, you know, if you have arthritis, but you gotta be aware that some drugs will make you react more severely to, you know, allergies or anything. Um, I have a little documentation that I found on that, but there's not a lot of information on it. Uh, Roger Hoopengarner, I think I had another page here, uh, it told me that taking an aspirin before you go into the bee yard will help reduce the swelling of a sting. Uh, uh, probably a lot of you read the American Bee Journal. Uh, if you don't, you should get it because it's a good monthly magazine, uh, Bee Culture, American Bee Journal. Uh, Jerry Hayes does this uh, column called The Classroom. And, and one of his questions one time was, can someone who has tolerated stings over time, sometimes for years, have all of a sudden changed to, in a response to the, for the worst to a sting? And that, the answer is yes. I've heard of beekeepers who were beekeepers for years and thought they were immune and had a reaction. So it's really not a bad idea to have an EpiPen around. But his answer was yes, ACE inhibitors are prescribed to some heart patients, blood pressure meds, pain relievers called NASAIDs, uh, common ones are Celebrex and Motrin, can all make someone who is tolerating stings well into someone having a major adverse reaction. And that's sort of what was happening to me. I started to react more to the stings on my hands because of the ibuprofen that I was taking. So just be aware of it. It's just something that people should know about. Um, not everybody even believes that it's possible, but uh, I just wanted to mention it. Let's move on. I hear this all the time. There's a couple things about plastic foundation. I use plastic foundation because when the brood or honey, it, it doesn't sag. You got to cross wire wax and have crimp wire uh, to kind of hold it up. Otherwise, it'll fall out of the frames. And I just don't have the time for that. But natural wax is really better for bees. Um, and I use it in my honey supers because I can hang those crimp wire in there and I just, I use bobby pins to kind of hold it in place instead of buying the, yes. Um, so can you just uncap, when extracting honey in an extractor, yeah. can you just uncap wax frames and they won't break? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the yeah. End of it. No, they, oh yeah, sure you can. Well, they're, they're not wax frames, it's wax foundation that has the imprint of a, and they build it out into comb. So the only part that's plastic <laughs> Oh, wax, wax. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. 
Uh, it should have some wire support in it. Even with wires, it still is okay, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, <coughs> I tell you. After it gets a little older, I mean, even my wax frames that have crimp wire will blow out occasionally in the extract of the first year. But after a couple of years, they've reinforced it so much that it, it, it extracts okay. I um, don't have natural comb without any reinforcing, so I couldn't tell you. I do know that even well, like to take the top bars, uh, you know, some of you may have a top bar hive. If you take and take your top bar and f just flip it like you would a normal frame, it probably, if it had a lot of honey or brood in it, it'd probably break off and fall on your shoes. Uh, so you gotta treat them differently. You gotta turn them this way and keep them parallel. Um, and uh, it's the same thing with wax. So you gotta be a little more careful with it, but you can extract wax. Um, I buy crimp wire with hook foundation and I put it in those split frame and I put a couple bobby pins in the sides to kind of hold it and they build the comb into them and hold it and, and I, actually my wax, I don't rotate my combs out like I, I do in my wax uh, for my uh, honey production and some of those combs are pretty old, real old. They, in fact, they get stronger I think every year a little bit. And probably it's the same way with natural foundation, but I think you would have to be a little more careful about extracting it because it blows out pretty easy. It just breaks right off. and Even with wires, it'll do that. Okay, so anyway, the black foundation uh, versus white. Uh, probably some of you know the answer to this, but uh, why would... Um, the reason I like dark foundation is I can, you can see the eggs better, you know, when you're looking at it in the brood nest area. Now, you may want white foundation if you're going to use plastic just to see what color the honey is. And those would be the differences uh, for me that I would say um, if you're looking at plastic. The other thing is they don't, don't wax plastic foundation or plastic frames for that matter, with, put enough wax on them and the bees generally don't like them as well as wax. I oftentimes will put a little more wax on them. I've got a couple different methods. One is just dipping them, another one is use a paintbrush with, and put hot wax on them. And, and when I'm in the bee yard and I open one up and they've stripped the wax off it or if it's uh, not a lot of wax, I'll, I'll take uh, these one ounce bars I carry them right in my pocket and I'll just kind of go over it like a crayon, and, and when you go over that, it uh, leaves little particles of wax just on the ridges, and it, um, it'll, uh, they'll take that wax because it's out of place and build it out, and then all of a sudden you got a pattern. Am I over, running over? Probably, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, adding supers, honey production. I, uh, there's, you can top super, or you can bottom super. I, I used to bottom super everything, which means you're taking and putting an empty box, uh, honey box, um, super honey super just above the brood nest, and that makes the bees think that they've got lots of room, and, it, and it's open more. It gives the bees that are getting a little older a place to go. It, it reduces swarming, I think, and it encourages them to produce, uh, studies say, maybe 10 or 20% more honey. The only problem is, you got to take all those heavy ones off and then put them above it, you know. And, and, uh, the other thing that uh, a lot of beekeepers, if you got an extractor, just take after you get two or three a boxes on, they start to fill them out and they start to seal them. You could actually take the one off at a time, brush them out, or or whatever method you want to use to remove them and, and do, do it that way. But you don't have it doesn't seem like you have as big a population when you do that. Uh, these guys get pretty full of bees, um, and they make a lot of honey once they get built up like that. But um, here's, here's how I would bottom super. I, this is on my website, but uh, I just would take super one and above the high body, and then one goes up, and I put two on, and then I put another one as a safety valve so they don't run out. And then the next time I'll go there, and if they've started working on three, then I, I move that down to the bottom and then I just push them up. Um, 
and just keep pushing them up until I get ready to take them off. And they get too high, then you, you need to. But I get so busy with other things, raising queens and that in the summer, I don't have time to take them off until I, I, I have to. Uh, but uh, just some ideas on how you want to how you want to do it. Uh, it gets kind of dangerous if you go up past. Now, I've had 10 supers on a high before, and uh, it gets pretty high. You have to work off a step ladder. It's kind of neat to see, but it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK, queen rearing biology, uh, queen substance, queen, the mandibular pheromone is the queen substance, and she passes that around the hive. It's transferred by feed communication. The queen substance, once it gets to a level of 13 micrograms, 0.13 micrograms, they'll start to think they need to replace her once that threshold on the average for all bees gets below that. Uh, they'll start queen cells and um, so when swarming happens, the reduction in the threshold level because of the number of bees in the colon, there's just so many bees and they're uh, and then also there's a tarsal pheromone that when she walks around, they can tell where she's been. And if she quits covering the whole brood nest area, they think that maybe they need to replace her too. So when that drops off. And the other thing is overcrowding of middle-aged bees in the hive. The middle-aged bees are the comb builders and they receive the honey and they put the pollen in and pack it in with their heads and do all the those things. And when they are crowded, say on a rainy day by the field bees, it pushes them down. Then they start to, uh, they're the ones that build the, they're the troublemakers. They, st they start building the swarm cells. And so um, that's how you control. You got to make sure that the hives get enough room that they um, don't feel crowded, especially when it's rainy. They, the queen's laying and she fills up the brood nest and all of a sudden she doesn't have any place to lay. They're crowded because all the bees that are um, crowded in that, that hive and then they build these swarm cells and the next thing you know, three or four days, the queen's gone and you've got, you've got to wait for almost three weeks for another queen, or over three weeks actually.